Time also has this big relationship with our memory and how we perceive it. We cannot make more time, but time will stretch to accommodate what we choose to put into it. Are you watching this on your phone? After you hear this, you may want to put it away for a while. Need motivation? Watch the top 10 we believe nation. Top 10, top I got a top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men. All my life, like nine and nine. She's Laura Vander Kim, and here's my take on her top 10 rules of success. Enjoy! Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one. Manipulate your perception of time. There's a couple ways of looking at time. I mean, one is very straightforward. It marches forward. We have 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, and once a second is gone, it is gone. You cannot get it back. So there's that. But time also has this big relationship with our memory and how we perceive it. And when we think about how much time we have, that's actually a function of how many memories we have of any given unit of time. I mean, one way of thinking of this is if you go on a vacation somewhere exotic, you know, it can feel like a week has passed before breakfast, because I mean, you know, your brain has no idea what it needs to remember, and so it's remembering all of it. And as it's remembering all these things, it's making you feel like you have more time. Whereas if you consider an average Tuesday, I mean, most people can't even remember getting dressed in the morning and getting to work. Somehow it happened, but it's just gone, right? It's not there at all. And so when you know that, you can start to manipulate this, your perception of time. Uh, you can put more memorable things into your life. Uh, one thing I tell people is to try to answer the question of why today is gonna be different from any other day in your life. And if you can answer why it's different, you're more likely to remember it. And if you have more days that you remember, you start to feel like you have more time. Rule number two, define your priorities in life. One of the women whose time log I studied, she goes out for a Wednesday night for something. She comes home to find that her water heater has broken. And there is now water all over her basement. If you've ever had anything like this happen to you, you know it is a hugely damaging, frightening, sopping mess. So she's dealing with the immediate aftermath that night. Next day, she's got plumbers coming in. Day after that, professional cleaning crew dealing with the ruined carpet. All this is being recorded on her time log. Winds up taking seven hours of her week. Seven hours. That's like finding an extra hour in the day. But I'm sure if you had asked her at the start of the week, could you find seven hours to train for a triathlon? Could you find seven hours to mentor seven worthy people? I'm sure she would have said what most of us would have said, which is, no. Can't you see how busy I am? Yet when she had to find seven hours, because there is water all over her basement, she found seven hours. And what this shows us is that time is highly elastic. We cannot make more time, but time will stretch to accommodate what we choose to put into it. And so the key to time management is treating our priorities as the equivalent of that broken water heater. And to get at this, I like to use some language from one of the busiest people I ever interviewed. By busy, I mean she was running a small business with 12 people on the payroll. She had six children in her spare time. I was getting in touch with her to set up an interview on how she had it all, that phrase. I remember it was a Thursday morning, and she was not available to speak with me, of course, right? But the reason she was unavailable to speak with me is that she was out for a hike, because it was a beautiful spring morning, and she wanted to go for a hike. So, of course, this makes me even more intrigued, and when I finally do catch up with her, she explains it like this. She says, listen, Laura, everything I do, every minute I spend is my choice. And rather than say, I don't have time to do X, Y, or Z, she'd say, I don't do X, Y, or Z because it's not a priority. I don't have time often means it's not a priority. Rule number three, make a three-category priority list. I know what often happens Friday afternoon. If you're working a Monday through Friday schedule, you're kind of sliding into the weekend at that point, maybe even hiding out so nobody finds you. It's really hard to start anything new on Friday afternoon, but you might be willing to think about what future you should be doing. And if you spend a little bit of time on Friday afternoons planning the week ahead, you can turn what might be wasted time into your most productive minutes of the week. So Friday afternoon, 
few minutes, make yourself a short three category priority list for the next week. Career, relationships, self. Making a three category list reminds you that there should be something in all three categories. So that right there is gonna nudge you to plan a more balanced week and have a more balanced life. It doesn't have to be long, just a few short things in each, but look at your week, see where they can go, front load the week if you can, uh, do as much of it as you can Monday and Tuesday, because you know what, stuff's gonna come up. Could be good stuff, could be bad stuff. But by planning the week ahead and putting what matters to you into your schedule first, you vastly increase the chances that that stuff gets done. Rule number four, chunk down your goals. How can people allocate a, a usable amount of time to things that they're passionate about but that are ultimately going to take a long time to do? How do they keep that from being overwhelming? How do they make sure that they have success so they're not discouraged? Do you encourage people to think of their life in, in a year chunk, in smaller chunks? So if it's a, a big project like writing a book, you want to say in that year-end holiday letter that you wrote a book. Well, then you can start breaking it down and putting things related to that on each week's priority list, right? So maybe this week you think, well, what step could I take toward doing that? Well, I'm going to write, you know, just what is the thesis of my book? All right, I did that. Great. That's all I have to do. All right, the next week I'm going to write maybe a couple chapters I think could be in that. Great. You've done it. The next week you're going to start writing little outlines in each of those chapters. Okay, you've done that. Moving forward. You don't want to overwhelm yourself. You want to, don't want to bite off more than you can chew, but if you are writing 1,500 words a week for the rest of the year, you're going to have a book at the end of it. And not a short one, actually. Uh, so it's these little things done repeatedly. If you only you know, set yourself a very small goal, but you meet it, and then you just keep going, you, you can do amazing things. Rule number five, put down the phone. Are you watching this on your phone? After you hear this, you may want to put it away for a while. I found that the most relaxed people check their phones about half as often as the people who felt most rushed. We often think that we have no free time, but we do. We just chop it up by looking at headlines, social media alerts, or maybe email, and then we find it hard to relax. I'm not saying give up the phone, but next time you have a little chunk of time, maybe while you're waiting for a phone call to start, Try doing something other than unlocking your screen. Use the time to reflect. I found that people who use bits of time to journal or meditate or do other reflective activities felt like they had a lot more time than people who spent those minutes on social media. Rule number six, use the concept of 100 dreams. I love this concept of 100 dreams. What is that? How do people use it? Why is it important? Yeah, so this was a great exercise that a career coach shared with me many years ago, which is, you know, it's a good answer to that question of <clears throat> people think they have no time and so they don't think of what they want to do with their time. And then when time appears, we do whatever is easiest because we don't think we have any time. We haven't thought about it, so that's why we wind up scrolling around on our phones all the time. The list of 100 dreams sort of helps to solve this. So completely unedited list of anything you want to spend more time doing. Um, so the first third is easy because people often want to travel more. So it's like the 33 countries they want to visit. So we got that. All right. But after that, it starts getting a lot harder. And people are like, oh, well, there's that state park an hour away. You know, we've lived here for six years. We've yet to get to. Or I you know, really want to bike more. There's a couple of bike trails near my house I want to do. Or, you know, I should read poetry. Or I'd, I'd like to go try that restaurant somewhere. Or, you know, get to the library and do whatever. Like, you start to get far more doable um, as you get toward 100. And you have to come back to this several times um, to, to actually get to 100. <clears throat> but then, having this list, when you have open time or you're making your priority list for the upcoming week, you say, well, let me pull something off that list. You know, maybe this is the weekend I will go to that state park or you know, I will go for that bike ride on you know, Tuesday over lunch if that's an option in your life. And then you're doing cool things, right? Rule number seven, build the life that you want. When people find out I write about time management, they assume two things. One is that I'm always on time, and I'm not. I have four small children, and I would like to blame them for my occasional tardiness, but sometimes it's just not their fault. I was once late to my own speech on time management. <laughs> We all had to just take a moment together and savor that irony. The second thing they assume is that I have lots of tips and tricks for saving bits of time here and there. And sometimes I'll hear from magazines that are doing a story along these lines, generally on how to help their readers find an extra hour in the day. 
And the idea is that we'll shave bits of time off everyday activities, add it up, and we'll have time for the good stuff. And I question the entire premise of this piece. But I'm always interested in hearing what they've come up with before they call me. So some of my favorites, doing errands in a way where you only have to make right-hand turns, <laughs> being extremely judicious in microwave usage, so it says three to three and a half minutes on the package, we are totally getting in on the bottom side of that. And my personal favorite, which makes sense on some level, is to DVR your favorite shows so you can fast forward through the commercials. And that way you save about eight minutes every half hour. So in the course of two hours of watching TV, you find 32 minutes to exercise. Which is true. You know another way to find 32 minutes to exercise? Don't watch two hours of TV a day, right? <laughs> anyway, the idea is we'll save bits of time here and there, add it up, we will finally get to everything we want to do. But after studying how successful people spend their time and looking at their schedules hour by hour, I think this idea has it completely backward. We don't build the lives we want by saving time. We build the lives we want and then time saves itself. Rule number eight, never use the snooze button. Pressing snooze is a lousy way to start your day. Not only is the sleep bad in little chunks of time, but you're not getting up and starting your day either. So it's really the worst of all worlds. Uh, I always tell people, just set your alarm for the time you actually intend to get out of bed. Enjoy every last minute of sleep right up until that point, and then go about your day. Uh, but I really think that good mornings are about having better days. How we start our days really sets the tone for the rest of our hours. And so if you start your day with this battle with the snooze button, well, that's going to take you through the rest of the day constantly feeling behind. But if you get up and do whatever it is that you intended to do, you'll have a much better day. Rule number nine, get out of a routine. Routines are great things, and, and you talk about this, and many of your guests have talked about this, and the importance of routine, because they make good habits automatic, right? And so we want to have good routines in our lives, but we don't want routines to be the only things in our lives, because then every day is the same as every other day. Um, so ways to think about this sort of authentically, I mean, we think about, like, what am I going to do on this weekend? Well, I could just, you know watch TV, put her around the house, and then it will feel like I didn't really have a weekend. Or you can maybe make a list of you know, anything in life or you know, the world you might want to see, in particular if we're thinking about a weekend, you know, things within two hours of your house probably that you're going to want to see. Uh, but anything you might enjoy, things your family members might enjoy. And then you can look at it and say, well, what of those things could I put into my schedule? And you know, on an average day, it might be something as simple as trying a new restaurant for lunch or having a conversation with a colleague that you've always just kind of waved to in the hall. Um, it could mean participating in a meeting that you normally just observe, like you actually speak up. But when you do little things like this, uh, you feel like you have more time. And if you really pause and enjoy these things and take in what's happening, then you can stretch the experience of time itself. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip, is use your time wisely. There are 168 hours in a week. 24 times 7 is 168 hours. That is a lot of time. If you are working a full-time job, so 40 hours a week, sleeping 8 hours a night, so 56 hours a week, that leaves 72 hours for other things. That is a lot of time. You say you're working 50 hours a week, maybe a main job and a side hustle. Well, that leaves 62 hours for other things. You say you're working 60 hours. Well, that leaves 52 hours for other things. You say you're working more than 60 hours. Well, are you sure? <laughs> there was once a study comparing people's estimated work weeks with time diaries, found that people claiming 75 plus hour work weeks were off by about 25 hours. <laughs> you can guess in which direction, right? Anyway, in 168 hours a week, I think we can find time for what matters to you. If you want to spend more time with your kids, you want to study more for a test you're taking, you want to exercise for three hours and volunteer for two, you can. And that's even if you're working way more than full-time hours. So we have plenty of time, which is great, because guess what? We don't even need that much time to do amazing things. But when most of us have bits of time, what do we do? Pull out the phone, right? start deleting emails, or otherwise we're puttering around the house or watching TV. But small moments can have great power, 
You can use your bits of time for bits of joy. Maybe it's choosing to read something wonderful on the bus on the way to work. I know when I had a job that required two bus rides and a subway ride every morning, I used to go to the library on weekends to get stuff to read. Made the whole experience almost, almost enjoyable. Breaks at work can be used for meditating or praying. If family dinner is out because of your crazy work schedule, maybe family breakfast could be a good substitute. It's about looking at the whole of one's time and seeing where the good stuff can go. I truly believe this: there is time. Even if we are busy, we have time for what matters. And when we focus on what matters, we can build the lives we want. In the time we've got. Now I've got a special bonus tip from Laura on how to go to bed earlier that I think you're going to enjoy. But before that, it's time for the three-point landing questions. Let's go from just watching the video to taking action. Here we go. Question number one: Where do you need to use your time more wisely? Number two: What's the routine that you need to get out of? And number three: How will you use the concept of 100 dreams? There are people who exercise on a shockingly regular basis. There are people who have very serious jobs who, who spend a lot of relaxed time with their families during the work weeks.、And、there are people who think beyond the day-to-day -day firefight and actually spend time planning and strategizing about their businesses and about their careers. And the funny thing is, these people all have the exact same 168 hours as everyone else. Their jobs are no less demanding, and their children are no less likely. To refuse to wear socks, or at least I think so. Maybe that's just my little angels who <laughs> refuse to wear their socks. But these people make things happen. They make important things happen because they get up and they do them first. So they do this little magic trick. I really almost think it, it is like a conjuring magic trick where they take. Unproductive evening hours—that time we all spend puttering around and watching television, watching other things—and they cut it off. They get to bed at a reasonable time, and they turn these unproductive evening hours into productive morning hours. They switch the time around. They get up, and they get stuff done. If you want to learn how to manage your time better, go check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. If you commit all that you are and all of your energy to one thing, you'll. We all have the same 24 hours in the day.